Hey everybody, I'm going to be reading you another short story by Rudyard Kipling. This one is called Lisbeth. Uh, I read it a little bit ago, actually probably about four or five months ago, and I really liked it. But I never got around to recording it because I've been ex extremely busy. I'd actually planned to have several um, amateur audiobooks out at this time, but it's just life gets crazy, you know. But I'm really happy that I can start now, and uh, let's begin. The story is called Lisbeth, and it was written by Rudyard Kipling in the year 1888. Look, you who have cast out love, what gods are these you bid me please? The three in one, the one in three? Not so. To my own gods I go. It may be they shall give me greater ease than your cold Christ entangled trinities. From the convert. She was the daughter of Sanu a hillman of the Himalayas, and Jada his wife. One year their maize failed, and two bears spent the night in their only opium poppy field just above the Sutla Valley on the Kotgar side. So, next season, they turned Christian and brought their baby to the mission to be baptized. The Kotgar chaplain christened her Elizabeth, or Lisbeth in the hill or Pahari pronunciation. Later, cholera came into the Kotgar Valley and carried off Sanu and Jada and Lisbeth became half-servant, half-companion to the wife of the then-chaplain of Kotgar. This was after the reign of the Moravian missionaries in that place, but before Kotgar had quite forgotten her title of Mistress of the Northern Hills. Whether Christianity improved Lisbeth, or whether the gods of her own people would have done as much for her under any circumstances, I do not know. But she grew very lovely. When a hill girl grows lovely, she is worth traveling fifty miles over bad ground to look upon. Lisbeth had a Greek face, one of those faces people paint so often and see so seldom. She was of a pale ivory color and, for her race, extremely tall. Also, she possessed eyes that were wonderful and, had she not been dressed in the abominable print clothes affected by the missions, you would, meeting her on the hillside unexpectedly, have thought her the original Diana of the Romans going out to slay. Lisbeth took to Christianity readily and did not abandon it when she reached womanhood, as do some hill girls. Her own people hated her because she had, they said, become a white woman and washed herself daily, and the chaplain's wife did not know what to do with her. One cannot ask a stately goddess five foot ten in her shoes to clean plates and dishes. She played with the chaplain's children and took classes in Sunday school, and read all the books in the house and grew more and more beautiful like the princess in fairy tales. The chaplain's wife said that the girl ought to take service in Simla as a nurse or something genteel. But Lisbeth did not want to take service. She was happy where she was. When travelers, there were not many in those years, came into Kotgar, Lisbeth used to lock herself in her own room for fear they might take her away to Simla, or out into the unknown world. One day, a few months after she was 17 years old, Lisbeth went out for a walk. She did not walk in the manner of English ladies, a mile and a half out with a carriage ride back again. She covered between 20 and 30 miles in her little constitutionals, all about and about between Kotgar and Arkunda. This time she came back at full dusk, stepping down the breakneck descent into Kotgar with something heavy in her arms. The chaplain's wife was dozing in the drawing room when Lisbeth came in breathing heavily and very exhausted with her burden. Lisbeth put it down on the sofa and said simply, This is my husband. I found him on the baggy road. He has hurt himself. We will nurse him, and when he is well, your husband shall marry him to me. This was the first mention Lisbeth had ever made of her matrimonial views, and the chaplain's wife shrieked with horror. However, the man on the sofa needed attention first. He was a young Englishman, and his head had been cut to the bone by something jagged. Lisbeth said she had found him down the hillside and had brought him in. He was breathing queerly and was unconscious. He was put to bed and tended by the chaplain who knew something of medicine, and Lisbeth waited outside the door in case she could be useful. She explained to the chaplain that this man she meant to marry, and the chaplain and his wife lectured her severely on the impropriety of her conduct. Lisbeth listened quietly and repeated her first proposition. It takes a great deal of Christianity to wipe out uncivilized Eastern instincts, such as falling love at first sight. Lisbeth, having found the man she worshipped, did not see why she should keep silent as to her choice. She had no intention of being sent away, either. 
she was going to nurse that Englishman until he was well enough to marry her. This was her program. After a fortnight of slight fever and inflammation, the Englishman recovered coherence and thanked the chaplain and his wife, and Lisbeth, especially Lisbeth for their kindness. He was a traveler in the East, he said. They never talked about globetrotters in those days, when the P&O fleet was young and small, and had come from Deherdun to hunt for plants and butterflies among the Simla hills. No one at Simla, therefore, knew anything about him. He fancied that he must have fallen over the cliff while reaching out for a fern on a rotten tree trunk, and that his coolies must have stolen his baggage and fled. He thought he would go back to Simla when he was a little stronger. He desired no more mountaineering. He made small haste to go away and recovered his strength slowly. Lisbeth objected to being advised either by the chaplain or his wife. Therefore the latter spoke to the Englishman and told him how matters stood in Lisbeth's heart. He laughed a good deal, and said that it was very pretty and romantic, but, as he was engaged to a girl at home, he fancied that nothing would happen. Certainly he would behave with discretion. He did that. Still, he found it very pleasant to talk to Lisbeth, and walk with Lisbeth and say nice things to her and call her pet names while he was getting strong enough to go away. It meant nothing at all to him, and everything in the world to Lisbeth. She was very happy while the fortnight lasted, because she had found a man to love. Being a savage by birth, she took no trouble to hide her feelings, and the Englishman was amused. When he went away, Lisbeth walked with him up the hill, as far as Narkunda, very troubled and very miserable. The chaplain's wife, being a good Christian and disliking anything in the shape of fuss or scandal, Lisbeth was beyond her management entirely, and told the Englishman to tell Lisbeth that he was coming back to marry her. She is but a child, you know, and, I fear, at heart a heathen, said the chaplain's wife. So all the twelve miles up the hill, the Englishman, with his arms around Lisbeth's waist, was assuring the girl that he would come back and marry her. And Lisbeth made him promise over and over again. She wept on the Narcuna Ridge till he passed out of sight along the Mutani path. Then she dried her tears and went into Kotgar again, and said to the chaplain's wife, he will come back and marry me. He has gone to his own people to tell them so. And the chaplain's wife soothed Elizabeth and said, He will come back. At the end of two months, Lisbeth grew impatient and was told that the Englishman had gone overseas to England. She knew where England was because she had read little geography primers, but of course, she had no conception of the nature of the sea being a hill girl. There was an old puzzle map of the world in the house. Lisbeth had played with it when she was a child. She unearthed it again and put it together of evenings and cried to herself and tried to imagine where her Englishman was. As she had no ideas of distance or steamboats, her notions were somewhat wild. It would not have made the least difference had she been perfectly correct, for the Englishman had no intention of coming back to marry a hill girl. He forgot all about her by the time he was butterflying in Assam. He wrote a book on the East afterwards. Lisbeth's name did not appear there. At the end of three months, Lisbeth made a daily pilgrimage to Narcunda to see if her Englishman was coming along the road. It gave her comfort, and the chaplain's wife, finding her happier, thought that she was getting over her barbarous and most indelicate folly. A little later, the walks ceased to help Lisbeth, and her temper grew very bad. The chaplain's wife thought this a profitable time to let her know the real state of affairs that the Englishman had only promised his love to keep her quiet, that he had never meant anything, and that it was wrong and improper of Lisbeth to think of marriage with an Englishman who was of a superior clay, besides being promised in marriage to a girl of his own people. Lisbeth said that all this was clearly impossible because he had said he loved her, and the chaplain's wife had, with her own lips, asserted that the Englishman was coming back. How can what he said be untrue? asked Lisbeth. We said it as an excuse to keep you quiet, child, said the chaplain's wife. Then you've lied to me, said Lisbeth. You and he? The chaplain's wife bowed her head and said nothing. Lisbeth was silent, too, for a little time. Then she went out down to the valley and returned in the dress of a hill girl, infamously dirty, 
but without the nose stud and earrings. She had her hair braided into the long pigtail, helped out by the black thread that hill women wear. I am going back to my own people, said she. You have killed Lisbeth. There is only left old Jada's daughter, the daughter of a Pahari and the servant of a Tarkadevi. You are all liars, you English. By the time that the chaplain's wife had recovered from the shock of the announcement that Lisbeth had verted to her mother's gods, the girl had gone, and she never came back. She took to her own unclean people savagely, as if to make up for the arrears of the life she had just stepped out of, and, in a little time, she married a woodcutter who beat her after the manners of the Paharis, and her beauty faded soon. There is no law whereby you can account for the vagaries of the heathen, said the chaplain's wife, and I believe that Lisbeth was always at heart an infidel. Seeing that she had taken into the Church of England at a mature age of five weeks, this statement does not do credit to the chaplain's wife. Lisbeth was a very old woman when she died. She had always a perfect command in English, and when she was sufficiently drunk could sometimes be induced to tell the story of her first love affair. It was hard then to realize that the bleared, wrinkling creature, exactly like a wisp of charred rag, could have ever been Lisbeth of the Kotgar Mission. Thank you everybody for listening. It's been a delight actually to be able to read one of these again. Um, and I'm hoping that I can bring out more in the future. If you did enjoy this, well, please stay tuned for more. There's going to be more someday. I swear, I swear, I swear there's going to be more. Just takes time. Thank you everybody and you have a wonderful day.